So this is the data. This is the uh, uh, true data, okay? And uh, what is the weak learner? The weak learner I'm actually using is decision stumps. Are you aware of what decision stumps are? So decision stumps are an extreme version of decision tree where you have the decision tree with depth equal to one. So you are going to decide based on just one feature and just threshold it. That means that the only types of classifiers possible are basically something like this. You have a line here and everything on this side is red and everything on this side is blue. And or you could have a line like this and everything on this side is red and everything on this side is blue. Only essentially you have a very small number of classifiers that are possible. You will see as time goes on, okay? So here I have set gamma equal to 0.2. Uh, that's kind of very aggressive. Uh, but I want to show fast progress. So essentially, the, if, you, if your gamma is really 0.2, if you set it to 0.1, it is going to still work. But the convergence is going to be slower. So it is better if you, I mean, if you want fast convergence, it's better to set gamma higher. But if you are not sure your weak learner is going to satisfy that gamma, then you are in trouble. So if, for example, if you can always set gamma equal to 0.5, you are, it is going to converge in one iteration but it is going to converge to the wrong answer. That's the uh, problem. So if you want to converge it to the right answer, then you must set your gamma low. If you want to converge fast, then you must set your gamma high. There is, a, uh, there is an interplay here, but for now, say we'll set gamma equal to 0.2. You'll assume that it is work, it's going to work, okay? So, okay, you do that. Now, what would a good weak learner be? So what's a candidate weak learner here? So what's a weak learner? I mean, what's a good decision stump for this data? Either do you want a horizontal line or a vertical line? Horizontal line. Say, uh, then this might be this a good line, right? So call this a horizontal line, and everything above this horizontal line is going to be red, or and everything below this horizontal line is going to be blue. That's going to be my decision. Oh, sorry, I did the other way around. So, uh, so I'm going to draw a horizontal line here, and everything below this horizontal line is going to be blue. Everything above is going to be red. They are equally valid, right? So that's what you do here. So that's what your first weak classifier. Now it's unweighted data. All data is unweighted, so you just do this. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, now, what has this classifier got wrong? Yes. These points it has got wrong. So that means that then the weight of these points must increase. The weight of all other points is going to stay the same. And that's what you'll see. Can you actually see these? Are there are bigger circles than this? Can you see that? These are actually bigger dots than these, okay? So now you have higher weights for this. Now I want to learn a weak classifier. What's a good weak classifier now? So these are, I mean, uh, so essentially how much is it weighted by? It's weighted by 2.33. That means that uh, these points now are worth, these points are now are worth 2.33 times these points. These, the, these points are now worth 2.33 times these points. So that's the beta role playing here. Okay, so now I want to, uh, I want a weak classifier. So what would be a good weak classifier now? Horizontal line or vertical line? Once again, horizontal line will work, but just that now you do the other thing. And the previous thing you drew a, a upper and you classified everything. Now you call this and call this everything above us red and everything below us blue. That's what you will do here. So that's what you will uh, learn. And now, okay, so now what's the, now what all have you gotten wrong now? The, yeah. These you have gotten wrong. So th this, the weight of this, this must increase. So now, at the end of it, uh, you have uh, these four sets of points. Now you have had two weak classifiers. Uh, these points and these points, both classifiers have got right. The points, these four sets of points, uh, one of them has got right, one of them got, got wrong. So that's the idea, okay? Now you want to, uh, now, uh, once again, all these points are worth, this point is worth 2.33 times this point, this point is worth 2.33, 2.33, 2.33. So these points are essentially worth 2.33 times uh, those points, okay? Now we want a weak classifier. What's a good weak classifier now? Horizontal line or vertical line? Now assume that these are, these are sufficiently heavy. This, instead of 2.33, say it is 100 for simplicity. Uh, how, what would you do now? Vertical line, yes. So, I mean, any vertical line is fine, so now this is the vertical line you choose. So essentially you uh, choose to use this vertical line and everything on the left is red and everything on the right is blue. That's what you have chosen to do, and that's what you have done now. So now what have you got wrong? You have gotten this wrong, in addition you also have gotten this wrong, which you have never gotten wrong before. In both your two classifiers got this part right. But now this third classifier, in an effort to get something right, it has gotten that wrong. 
Okay, so that's the thing. So now the weight of that also will increase. So you can see that uh, uh, now this will be 2.33. This will be one. So this everything has gotten right. This also everything has gotten right. This will be 2. Point, uh, what was the? This will be 2.33. This will be 2.33. This will be 2.33 squared because two classifiers have gotten uh, this set wrong. So this. Yeah, this will also be 2.33. So the weights never decrease. The weights always only ever keep on increasing. Okay. Uh, so now this point is worth 2.33 squared times this point, and this points are worth 2. So that's the idea. Okay. If you want the exact demarcation, it's like this. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's basically the idea. So you can keep on. So you can do a weak classifier now, and for this now, this turns out to be the best weak classifier. So now. Okay, now we want to stop now. And the what's the strong classifier? Okay, so we'll just go back here. Now you have learned all these weak classifiers, that's fine. But how are you going to combine them? Once again, the trivial way to combine them, what's the trivial way to combine them? Majority vote. That's the majority vote is the trivial way to combine them. And that's what you do. And if you do the majority vote, at you assume you stop this iteration now and you do a majority vote, this is what you would get. It looks not too bad in the sense that it gets these areas correct. And this area is correct. This area is kind of it's saying white. I don't know what white means. It can either mean red or blue, but it does not matter. It is anyway, saying these two are the same, which is wrong. They are both different. But more or less, it gets gotten. Uh, essentially, that's what you would guess, right? So in this data set, you can immediately say what is the toughest samples to get right. That would be these. Right? Those are the toughest samples to get right. And when in just four iterations, it is doing your strong classifier is doing well on all but those toughest points. Okay, so that's the uh, idea, uh, and you can keep on doing it. Okay, fine, it's not working, so I'll keep on doing it. So if you keep on doing it, so you can do it. Data five will be this, six will be this, so will be this, it will be this. So you do a strong classifier at the end of iteration eight. It again looks pretty much similar. Okay, oh, I mean, is it, is it hopeless now? Is it always going to stay that way? It does not, because your weights are always going to keep on increasing. At some point, you will see something like this. So because this set, you've gotten almost always wrong. This has become bloated to such an extent that almost nothing else matters. Your next weak classifier is forced to get these two correct. Now, all the others don't matter that much. Now, because now weights have multiplied by two, by say about two every time, these are very, very wrong when compared to other things which are mostly correct. So now finally, your weak classifier nine is going to draw a line in the middle, which is going to be enough to distinguish between these two. And now if you do, say plot your strong class, where you will see that this, this is light blue, this is light red. You can see that. So it's actually getting 100% accuracy now. Right. So that's the idea. So it's, uh, yeah. So that's, it's as simple as that. So you can, I mean, you can, you can it's, there's no need to stop. You can keep on going, but the, it, it, you cannot get more than 100% accuracy. So you'll stop here. So that's the idea. So any questions on this? Okay, now we'll come back to the algorithm actually. So I don't think I'll be able to do a proof of the algorithm because I wanted to show that the mistake will actually go to zero, but that's not a problem. I'll, uh, I can take it always offline. So this is the algorithm. The algorithm is now clear. I mean, when you just saw the algorithm, the notation is probably confusing you, but now you have something, an intuition of what's actually going on inside your mind. This is reasonably simple. Now you see what's actually happening and so on. So uh, is the algorithm clear now? To everybody. So the output, I'm just going to take the sign of, so it's plus minus one. So if I add everything, it's basically it's the majority of the thing. That's essentially what you're going to take. Yeah? Yeah, so uh, that's where theory comes in, right? I mean, why is beta this? Why is, why is it not just 0.5 plus gamma? Why is it not one plus two gamma? Why is it not gamma squared? Those are the questions, right? And that is where really theory comes to you. I mean, this looks out of the blue. Why is this number coming? And uh, that is where theory is going to help you. I mean, uh, you can't, I mean, you can't, uh, this looks strange. Why is this 0.5 plus gamma plus 0.5 minus gamma is coming there? And uh, that comes from theory. So that is where, I mean, uh, if you, I mean, that's a very crucial thing. I mean, if you do, if your beta is very high, you will be very aggressive in increasing the sample weights, and that might be wrong. If your beta was very low, you would be very, uh, conservative in raising your weights, and that's also bad. So essentially, you want the right beta, which is neither conservative nor aggressive. And uh, to get that, you need theory. So that's the that's the reason where I mean I think this 
our, I had planned it so it segues nicely into the learning theory part of it. So algorithms are one part, but without theory, you can't set these kind of parameters. Uh, these parameters are actually very important to this intuition you could have gotten even by like, yeah, I can go into, I'm going to build classifiers which are going to emphasize on the previous classifiers mistakes. This idea is simple. It does not require theory. But how much are you going to emphasize? How that those numbers are, once again, strange, right? So those numbers you have to get by theory. So if you have time, I'll go over theory. But if, even if you don't, you can always go through it. It's not a problem. Yeah? Any questions? Any other questions? OK. So uh, I don't think I'll be able to do a proof on the hands, but I'll just. Uh -huh. So that's a very good question. I, I was planning on segue into that after the letter. So I mean, if it's just point five, then you can't do anything. But if it's gamma, essentially what you can say is, I know it can do better than random, but it can that gamma can go arbitrarily close to zero. That is the standard uh, uh, assumption that. So your algorithm should take care of that. That's what that's the idea, and you can do that, and that is basically add a boost. So that's called adaptive boosting. So this boost by majority is you are, you, are, you are assuming that your weak learner has, say, if gamma is 0.1, that means that if, say, if gamma is 0.1, I'm saying that I can give any weights, any weighted sample, and I can achieve 0.6%, sorry, 60% accuracy. What if that's not true? What if my weak classifier is so weak that for there exists, I mean, it might work well on most of the weights, but if I give some weight, it is, you can't achieve 60% accuracy. What if I do that? But you can still achieve maybe 51% accuracy. The one thing to do is, OK, maybe set gamma to be 0 0.01 instead. That's OK. But then what if it, 51 is too much, but I can achieve 50.9? Then what? So, I mean, you don't know that, right? So you ideally want this gamma to be adaptive. And that's basically adaptive boosting. So you, you have your gamma set. So that will come uh, if we have time. Or I think I can also, because this is actually practical learning theory, I can also use the same uh, proof. If you, if you guys are interested, I can also actually segue into ADA boost, which is also theory, really. It's, uh, I can do that also, if you want. Yeah. Any other questions? Both your questions actually segue nicely into my future in the next slides. So it's OK? So this is the idea, OK? The, the thing that you consider is basically your total weights that you maintain. Okay, that's you at every iteration, you just consider this object. So don't read the entire thing, just read with me. Okay, so now you just consider the total weight. So at, at the first iteration, it's going to be the total number of samples. Because every sample has equal weight, it's going to be equal to m. If m is the number of samples, it's going to be equal to m. But every iteration, the weights are only going to increase. It's definitely going to increase. Because I'm never decreasing the weights, I'm only increasing the weights. So uh, this is the idea, okay? Now you will actually bound this quantity both above and below, and that will essentially help you. So here's the idea, right? So if your final classifier H makes M mistakes, okay, and because you're using majority voting, H is simply I mean H is your final classifier, and because you're using majority voting, that means that uh, at least T by two of the weak classifiers must have made mistakes on the same points, right? Otherwise, why would you? I mean, because it's a majority voting, that means that your T by two of the classifiers would have made mistakes. And that we, and uh, weight of the sample goes up by a factor of beta in step t if mistake is made, and weight of the sample, sample stays the same otherwise. So that means that the total weight must at least be m times beta power t by 2, right? So every, so if I get the m for now, take one sample which is on which you're making a mistake. That sample, that sample's weight must have increased at least t by 2 times because you have made you have t by 2 classifiers are making mistakes on that point. That means that that sample's weight must have increased at least t by 2 times. So that particular sample has a weight of beta power t by 2 at least. It can be greater, at least beta power t by 2. And you have m such samples. You have making m mistakes. So it's m beta power t by 2. So that's the, so your total weight is at least this much. OK, so that's the idea. OK, that's fine. Is this clear? I mean, uh, if not, also it's fine. But this is the idea. So. You understand the logic behind these two uh, steps because I'm using, here I'm using the fact that the final classifier is the majority classifier. That's what I'm really using. The next step, I will use the fact that each of the classifiers are actually weak learners. Here I've not used that actually, right? I mean, that's the next thing. Okay. So the next thing is basically, 
is a little bit more uh, uh, algebra, but it's not really complicated at all. So you have your z t plus one. So at the consider the total weights at iteration t plus one, which is basically sum over i equal to one to m w i t plus one, right? So I'm going to split this into two. At iteration t, say you have a set of the, the set of samples your h t got correctly. You have h t is the iteration as the use your weak classifier at iteration t, right? So say you have the set of samples for which you got HT got the right answer, you call that A. Okay, and the, so that means that I can just write this as a split sum. I mean, I can, I'm writing down this A times A and beta, right? So for A, the weight is not going to increase. At WT plus one is going to be the same as WT. Because I've gotten it right, the weight is not going to increase. But if I is not in A, the weight is going to increase by a factor of beta. Right, so that means that for i not in a, it's going to be beta times w i t. So it's all equality. So there is now no bounds here after. Okay, and here is where you use the fact that what is the weak learner assumption actually really? So that means that uh, if you give a weighted sample to your weak learner, your uh, sum over i belong to a w i is greater than or equal to. Uh, half plus gamma times sigma w i, right? Is this clear? I mean, maybe. So what is your weak learner guaranteed to do? It is guaranteed to do at least gamma better than random. That means that what is the uh, total number of samples it got right? Total weight of the samples it got right? It's basically sum over i in a <laughs> w i, right? That's the total weight of samples it got right. So this is at least half plus gamma of the total weight. That's basically, that's greater than or equal to half plus gamma sigma over i w i. The total weight of the samples it got right is at least half plus gamma of the total weight. So that's the, that's the weak learner assumption actually. So I can use that. I, and if I use that, that, this means that this is greater than or equal to 0.5 plus gamma w i t and uh, this is just 0.5 minus gamma w i t. And I can do that. And here is where your beta of 0.5 plus gamma by 0.5 minus gamma comes into the play. Because now beta is 0.5 plus gamma by 0.5 minus gamma, this 0.5 minus gamma cancels out and you can take 0.5 plus gamma outside. And you get 1 plus 2 gamma zt. That means that in every iteration, your zt plus 1 does not grow by more than 1 plus 2 gamma as a factor. So if you have uh, at iteration 1 it was 10, your zt was 10. Sorry, sorry, iteration t z t was 10. And iteration t plus 1, z, uh, z, t, z t plus 1, is can be at most 1 plus 2 gamma times 10. Say gamma was maybe 0.2, in which case it can be at most uh, 1.4 times 10. So that's the, that means that z t plus 1 cannot grow too fast. That's what is essentially saying. Z, uh, your z t cannot grow, to, mean as the number of iterations increases, z t cannot grow too fast. But you have this that z t, is at least this much. ZT is growing fast, that's what this is saying. And uh, ZT cannot grow too fast, that's what this is saying. And you can basically put those both together, which is basically your ZT plus one is greater than or equal to, ZT is growing fast, but ZT is growing slow. So that's, there are two contradictory statements, but both are true. Right? That means that you can put them together and you'll get this. That means that your M is your total number of mistakes. Total number of mistakes is less than or equal to M times this is just algebra, don't worry about it. It's one minus four gamma squared power t by two. So if gamma is greater than zero, one minus four gamma squared is going to be less than one, right? That means that every iteration and power t by two is there. That means that even if it's one minus four gamma squared is 0.99, 0.99 power one million is going to be practically zero. Say, I mean, one, don't need to, you need to go to one million, even for 0.99 power you're going to get zero. That means that your total number of mistakes is going to go to zero as your number of iterations increases. And this is where you are, the fact that uh, you had to use beta equal to 0.5 plus gamma by 0.5 minus gamma was actually used because that was actually crucial here. That's, that's what allowed you to take your 0.5 plus gamma outside and you can do this. So that's, that's where, I mean, this is to illustrate that theory plays a very, very fundamental role in algorithms. Algorithms and theory don't exist separately. So uh, theory and algorithms are easy to understand, but theory is where you actually get, I mean, if you didn't know this, 
you would you try, try brute force over all possible betas I mean is that a valid thing i mean it's not a viable uh, hypothesis so it's, it's that's where theory comes into the rescue okay okay so I'll, maybe i'll just introduce adabus okay so what is the issue with boost by majority that's exactly what uh, uh, i didn't get your name uh, nikhil nikhil yeah. so i mean this is exactly the issue that nikhil raised so now you see that the algorithm actually uses gamma what if you don't know gamma you know gamma is greater than 0 say somehow you know that gamma is greater than 0 but you don't know gamma then what would you do so uh, it requires a bound on gamma and that's essentially you need to know how good the weak classifiers are in advance that's what you need to know and maybe you don't know that what would you do then and the problem is if gamma is set too small the algorithm will converge slowly uh, and if it is set too high the convergence proof will not hold and it can just as well uh, so this also i i will try to show this in the uh, lab part where you will actually implement ada boost and you will set gamma i mean you know the true gamma but you will actually set either gamma to be too low or too high and you will see the convergence either too slow or converging to a wrong answer you will see both of these hopefully if we have time but uh, that's the idea so can we do better and that is where your adaptive boosting comes in so it's more or less exact more or less the same but just that now you are going to calculate gamma for every weak classifier so you I mean you have the weak classifier you may just as well calculate how much it is better than random right i mean you have the weak classifier instead of saying that uh, oh i want this classifier to be say 0.1 better than random i can just as well calculate how much it is better than random which is that's what this is don't forget about the math there what this gamma t is telling is how much is ht better than random which is what gamma was but now we have gamma t now we have a dependence on t it is possible that at iteration 1 you have very good gamma we, we might uh, have uh, maybe even an edge of 0.4 or 0.3 but at maybe iteration 20 you can have only have an edge of maybe gamma to be even 0 0.01 it's possible so now you have a gamma dependence on t and you have a beta which is simply 0.5 plus gamma t by 0.5 minus gamma t that's not a problem everything else goes through but there is one slight twist it's no longer majority voting you can see that if you do this uh, but keep on doing the majority voting you will run into an issue that's basically that for example say take the extreme case your first class where was extremely accurate it was almost say take the extreme case gamma gamma 1 was 0 0.5 okay if gamma 1 was 0 0.5 what would happen is beta would actually be infinity right that means that uh, you would at the end of iteration uh, 1 you did iteration 2 iteration 2 all uh, weights would be all over the place it, they would be unstable it's, it would be unstable and uh, it, uh, that's that's kind of recipe for failure and uh, but if you that but you don't know that you run it for say 10 iterations actually you could have just stopped at one iteration and you could have just taken the first classifier and ignored all the it classifies 2 to 9 but now because you are doing majority voting you will also consider uh, i mean essentially you have you have to make a decision on physics and the first person you ask is albert einstein and then the next uh, the nine person that you ask are, ask are maybe people who failed lkg okay so that's what you ask and then you take a majority vote of that right that's not really going to work okay so that's the extreme example and uh, in this case you have to weight the classifiers accordingly so in this case you would give a weight of infinity to albert einstein and everyone else give a weight of zero that's what you would do and that's what it essentially does so you give a weight of log one by beta t so you don't need to get the exact formula of it i mean once again these numbers you get only from theory why is log one by beta t coming there i mean that's that seems strange i mean you can guess that it's going to be if your beta is uh, uh, high that means that you need to give low weight for this and so on so that you can guess but how high how low that that once again comes only from proper uh, theoretical analysis and uh, yeah i'm not going to give that proof but it's it's the philosophy is same the proof techniques also almost exactly the same you just bound the uh, total weight of the samples you bound it from below you bound it from above uh, but just that now it's no longer majority voting so it's not going to be this is not going to be as simple so you have to take into account the that it is not majority voting uh, but that's basically it. So, any other questions? Any questions on this? So, yeah, I mean, I did boosting entirely for binary classification. Uh, you, 
uh, with learners that actually output either, either plus one or minus one, but you can, you might just as well have learners that output a probability of a class. It's, it need not just output plus one or minus one. It can say uh, it is plus one with probability 0.7, minus one with probability 0.3. You can extend boosting to work with that. That's why you have the, that's the reason you have this uh, uh, modulus of HT minus XI minus YA in the first place. I mean, if it's HT is going to be either just plus one or minus one, this seems overkill, right? I mean, uh, but it will work even if you have uh, learners that output probability of a class. I will also work with multi-class learners. I mean, this was just binary classification. You can also have multi-class. It requires modifications, but it is possible. And uh, there are other reweighting schemes. Uh, the problem generally with auto boost is that uh, it is not very robust to outliers. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not defining what outliers are for you now, but it's essentially, it's, it's a problem that you will uh, uh, you'll encounter. And uh, there are other reweighting schemes. I mean, because the weight explodes exponentially, right? I mean, every time you get it wrong, you are multiplying by something. And that's a very, very unstable situation. I mean, it can clearly, I mean, even if you run for 100 iterations, you might actually hit the floating point limit, right? So that's not a very good situation to be in. You have gentler methods, which increase the weight slower. So these methods are more robust outliers. Uh, for example, they are called maybe logit boost and so on. Uh, but they are more complicated analysis than Ada boost. So, but Ada boost is the, uh, uh, once again, Ada boost is a very popular learner. It's, it, it's something which you will see often. Yeah. And uh, say for references, uh, bagging and random forests should, uh, Leo Bremen was the guy who uh, introduced and popularized both of them. And boosting was introduced in a set of papers by Yoav Frund and Robert Shapire, almost independently, but then they collaborated together in the late 90s. So they're, they're classic papers uh, in machine learning. So that's basically it. We can break, or if you have any questions, we can ask. If you have no other questions, we can uh, wrap up for this session and can have a break.